Modern-day Turkey is a fascinating mix of bustling, crowded cities and rich, fertile agricultural areas where grapes flourish under blue skies. Its people are hardworking and friendly to strangers. Tourists come here seeking a taste of biblical history or to roam the sites of cities that once dominated the landscape of ancient Anatolia. The Apostle John spent his latter years on a rocky outcrop not far from the western shores of this vast land, about twice the size of Texas. He wrote to the fledgling Christians in seven major centers. Many were struggling with persecution and discouragement under Roman oppression. Today we visit the site of ancient Philadelphia and discover these letters from a lonely isle. Welcome to Turkey, the land of the seven churches. We've come to Istanbul to start our journey, tracing a letter that John wrote in the book of Revelation over 1900 years ago. Turkey is a land where Christianity once flourished, but now Muslim mosques dominate the landscape. Istanbul, a city straddling two continents, Europe and Asia. Today it's a bustling metropolis of 10 million people. The city has more than 2,000 mosques, and 98% of the people claim Islam as their religion. Istanbul has witnessed its share of cultural upheavals, a remarkable assortment of Greek, Roman, and Byzantine emperors, as well as Ottoman sultans, left their mark on this place its passageways echoed with their footsteps, its doors swung wide for their splendid entrances. But one door in particular has an important story to tell. One door changed the course of history, and today we'll discover how an open door can change our own story. It has stood the test of time. God's Book, the Bible. Still relevant in today's complex world. It is written. Sharing hope around the globe. Presented by Mark Finley. Find the open door. As our boat pulls into the harbor at the island of Patmos, my mind is wandering, wandering back 2,000 years. And I think of a time when another boat pulled in here. That boat was carrying the Apostle John. I wonder what he must have been thinking. I wonder what was going through his mind. I wonder what thoughts he had. An exile, far away from home, separated by the sea. He probably felt lonely and cold and tired. And he wondered if he'd die here. He wondered if he'd spend the rest of his life here. Although isolated on this barren, rocky outcrop, John received a special visitor. It was none other than the resurrected, glorified Christ. You can read about the remarkable encounter in Revelation chapter 1. Christ wanted John to send letters to several churches across the Aegean Sea in Asia Minor, now the country of Turkey. Messages that are included in the book of Revelation. Jesus Christ, the head of the church, and the great physician of souls was extending his care to these congregations, among them believers in a place called Philadelphia, the youngest of the seven churches. He had a diagnosis and a prescription that related to their particular problems. Today, little remains of the ancient city the town of al has been built on the site, but Philadelphia was quite a metropolis. It was located at the foot of Mount Tamalus, 24 miles southeast of Sardis on the road to Colossae. The city was founded by Attalus II Philadelphus of Pergamum. He named it Philadelphia, which means brotherly love, as an indication of loyalty to his elder brother. It was a refreshing gesture because in that age, royal siblings often were assassinated to prevent battles over the throne. 
In AD 17, an earthquake destroyed Philadelphia. The Emperor Tiberius rebuilt it into an impressive place. In fact, because of its beauty, ancient writers referred to it as Little Athens. So the message from Jesus Christ through John arrived at a large Roman city. The Christian believers here weren't living in some little country town. They were surrounded by the temples and theaters and imperial halls of pagan Rome. And they were having a problem, a big problem with their confidence. They were feeling intimidated. Let's look at the message John penned here at Patmos for believers in Philadelphia. It's found in Revelation chapter 3. This is actually one of the most encouraging letters of all those sent to the seven churches of Asia Minor. But first, let's look at the diagnosis Jesus, the great physician, gives us as a clue to what was ailing believers in Philadelphia. Let's look in Revelation chapter 3 and the last part of verse 8. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Interesting comment, isn't it? Fascinating you have little strength. Christians in Philadelphia had grown spiritually weak. But notice what the diagnosis is. Believers there weren't in danger of compromise or corruption like the church at Thyatira. They weren't in danger of imminent death like the church at Sardis. These people wanted to serve God. They were committed Christians. They had kept God's word. They had not denied him. But the great physician saw that they had little spiritual strength. Their faith was waning. What they were suffering from was a confidence problem. They were feeling intimidated by the forces around them. We see that a little more clearly in the next verse, in verse 9. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Evidently, there were Jews in Philadelphia who felt intense hostility toward the new Christian faith. They felt Christians were heretics who denied the faith of the fathers. Some of the rabbis were rather fanatical, described at the time as a synagogue of Satan. And it appears that Christian believers were being intimidated by them. Christ promises that these fanatics will fall down before believers they will be forced to acknowledge that the church at Philadelphia is loved by God. That's the picture Christ holds up before these Christians. In other words, he wants to move them from a place of weakness, of little strength, to a place of confidence. Confidence in their ability to stand firm. Confidence that their faith will ultimately prevail. Confidence that they are cherished by God. This is the Greek Orthodox Monastery of St. John the Theologian, built on Patmos in 1088 in honor of the apostle who spent his time of exile here. The monastery itself is a kind of island within this island. It's interconnecting courtyards, stairways, and roof terraces are all constructed within tall, thick walls. There's a reason for this heavily fortified style. Pirate ships and Seljuk Turk vessels sailing by here often threatened to attack. The Orthodox Greek monastery had treasures that it wanted to keep safe. Patmos was famous for its place in Bible history. This is the treasury of the monastery. Here are many priceless gifts received from royalty. There are also many early biblical manuscripts, including a sixth century one of Mark's gospel, written on purple vellum or young animal skins. And so the monks had to fight off those who would plunder this place. They were successful because of the fortifications. That's how people of faith sometimes feel. Even today, besieged, threatened, an island within an island. It's hard to feel confident when the big bad world out there keeps assaulting your values. It's hard to feel strong when you're so isolated. But the great physician wants bigger and better things for us. He wants us to be able to reach out confidently beyond our defensive island. He wants us to be secure in our faith. And this is the prescription he gives us.
let's look again at his letter to the church in Philadelphia. This is the message he has for people who have little strength, found in Revelation 3 and verses 7 and 8. These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength. Jesus says, I have set before you an open door. That's the truth Jesus wants these people to grasp. He repeats it. He emphasizes it. Look at the open door. If you feel intimidated, look for an open door. If you feel isolated, look for an open door. If you feel weak and discouraged, look for an open door. But what does that mean? It means don't just look at the problem. Don't just look at the obstacle. Don't just look at the enemy. God is creating a way out somewhere. God is creating a solution somewhere. But you have to look for it. You can't just stare at what's wrong. You've got to see what God is doing right. Sometimes we get so fixed on how awful the problem is that we miss God's solution when it comes by. It may seem like the obstacle you're facing is a huge stone wall before you. But sometimes one little open door can make all the difference. Let me give you a very dramatic example. In 1452, an army of Ottoman Turks sailed up the Bosphorus and laid siege to what was then the city of Constantinople. It was a well-fortified metropolis that had stood as the center of the Byzantine Empire, the center of the Christian world, for a thousand years. It had resisted scores of determined attacks, but this time, led by Sultan Mehmet, the Turks would break through those enormous walls. This time, they would prevail. The fall of Constantinople was a watershed event in history. The city of Christian church councils, the city of the Haggai Sophia, would become the seat of sultans, the capital of the Ottoman Empire. There were many forces, of course, that led to the triumph of one empire over another. But if you could point to one single event that marked the turning point, it was the moment that the Turks discovered an open door. Wedged into the formidable walls of Constantinople was an old gate called the Kirka Porta. It had been cut into the base of the wall on a level with the bottom of the dry moat outside it. The Kirka Porta had once functioned as an emergency exit, but after someone prophesied that an enemy would enter the city through it, the Byzantines closed it up. During the Turkish siege, some Greek soldiers who were helping defend Constantinople got an idea. They decided that a large body of troops could quickly pass through this concealed entryway and attack the left wing of the Turks by surprise. So the Greeks dug out the bricks and reopened the gate, posting a guard there. Well, soon the Turks were attacking at other points around the city. Constantinople's troops had to scurry here and there to repel the attackers who were throwing ladders up to scale the walls. The Greeks had to abandon their surprise counterattack, and everybody forgot that the gate had been opened. Not long afterward, a group of Turkish soldiers were running down the dry moat leading an assault. To their surprise, they came on a low-lying gate, the Kirka Porta, and saw it open. Rushing in, they killed the guards. The Turks hoisted up a signal, and soon a thousand soldiers had rushed into the city. Constantinople was doomed. Many armies had come against the walls of Constantinople over the centuries. The Byzantines inside were often outnumbered and outgunned. But getting from the outside to the inside through three layers of defenses had almost always proved impossible. Impossible until someone discovered one little open door. One little open door. And a whole empire came crashing down. A whole era in history closed and another began. This is the message that Jesus Christ gives to people who've lost their confidence to people whose strength is slipping away. Look for the open door. 
It's a message of encouragement from a great physician. He's making a promise to each and every one of us. He's saying that in every situation you're in, no matter how dark, no matter how desperate, he will create an open door. He will create a way out. He will create a solution. Just look for it. Just keep looking for that open door. It's important to persevere. Listen to the great physician in Revelation chapter 3 and verses 10 and 11. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. Jesus promises we'll make it through the hour of trial if we just persevere. If we just keep looking for that open door, Jesus is coming quickly. He's on his way with an answer. He's on his way with a solution. Don't let anything keep you from seeing that open door. Hold fast to that expectation. Hold fast to that faith in the God who can do more than we can ask or imagine. The God for whom nothing is impossible. Friends, I believe in a God who opens doors in our individual lives. I believe in a God who opens doors in history. Think about the fall of Constantinople, for example. This city had served as the center of Christianity for centuries. This cathedral, the Hagia Sophia, was one of the wonders of the world. As the city collapsed and the Ottoman Turks rushed in, it must have seemed like the end of the world to many believers. On that day in 1453, it must have seemed like God had abandoned his Christian followers. Well, let's think about what God was doing back in 1453. What was happening in the European world? Nothing less than the Protestant Reformation. John Huss in Bohemia and John Wycliffe in England had already prepared the way. Luther would soon forge a spiritual revolution in Germany. It would fan out all over Europe and produce a spiritual awakening. It turned into such a powerful spiritual awakening that it would reverberate down through the centuries. One door had tragically closed, but another door was opening in Europe. One city had been decaying spiritually for some time and finally collapsed. But in another place, a reformation was being born that would change the world. Yes, in any and every situation, God is creating an open door. Let me give you another example. The Church of Philadelphia actually represents a particular period in church history, a period of spiritual awakening in the 17 and 1800s. Printing presses by then were producing thousands of Bibles, and mission societies began to send missionaries around the world. There was a great revival of interest in the books of Daniel and Revelation, a renewed interest in Bible prophecy. The Spirit moved on people's hearts. There was a great expectation that the coming of Jesus was near. All of this opened doors for the proclamation of the gospel. In 1843, Bible students all over the world concluded that Jesus Christ was going to return. On the designated date, October 22, 1844, they waited with intense expectation. Many had given away all their possessions. They were ready for the kingdom of Christ to interrupt human history. They waited all day. They waited all night. And by October 23, they had fallen into despair. It had all been a terrible mistake. Like the early disciples who anticipated the coming of Jesus and who anticipated Christ would establish his kingdom on earth, but died on a cross. These Bible students in the 1840s, like those early disciples, were bitterly disappointed. These believers, too, felt that God had let them down. After all, they had studied the prophecies of Revelation so carefully and prayerfully. They had been so earnest. But the heavens were a blank. Christ hadn't made an appearance. They had become the butt of jokes. Their confidence was shattered. A few of them, however, 
began to look at the prophecies and promises of the Bible from a different perspective. They began to try to see a bigger picture. And this promise in Revelation of an open door caught their eye. These Adventists, as they were called, discovered wonderful truths about Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. They got a clearer picture of how he stands as our mediator, our high priest, before the Father. That's what the prophecies they were looking at had pointed forward to. So they were able to move out of bitter disappointment and into a brighter hope, a deeper appreciation of the saving work of Jesus Christ. That became an open door for them. The church at Philadelphia is the church of the open door. Scripture says that this church has the key of David. The key of David is the messianic prophecy given through David of the coming Messiah. This key of David also includes the day when the Messiah comes the second time to establish his eternal, everlasting kingdom. God set an open door before the church at Philadelphia, a door no human being could shut. God had opened a door for the proclamation of the message of the second advent, and no one could shut it. And I can tell you that right now Christ is opening doors all over the world, opening doors for the spread of the Adventist message, the gospel, the good news that he will soon return, the good news that he is Lord of all. I've watched them kneel here in this auditorium and receive new life in Christ. Hundreds have been baptized. Recently, it was my privilege to see thousands and thousands respond to this message in major cities on almost every continent. The response to the Spirit's call was overwhelming for me. You can't see that and not know that God is indeed opening doors for the gospel. He creates a spiritual momentum that nothing can stop. Remember how Jesus identified himself to believers in Philadelphia? He is the one who opens doors. And furthermore, he's the one who opens a door which no man can shut. Christ is stronger than any power that can rise up against us. He defeats the immovable object. He defeats the irresistible force. No one can shut a door that he opens. Lazarus was shut up in a grave for four days. A huge gravestone had been rolled against the entrance to his tomb. But Jesus opened a door. Lazarus walked out of that tomb alive. It was a door that no one else could open and no one else could shut. A beggar wailing by the side of the road had been shut up in blindness from the day of his birth. He had never seen the light of day, but Jesus stopped and touched his eyes. And Jesus opened the door and a whole new world appeared for this man. It was a door no one else could open and no one else could shut. Twelve disciples were shut up in an upper room, despairing over the loss of their master, fearing for their lives. Their confidence shattered, but a resurrected Christ appeared to them and asked them to touch the wounds in his hands. Those twelve men walked out to boldly bear witness to what they had seen and heard and to turn the world upside down. They passed through a door no one else could open and no one else could shut. That's what the great physician does. He sends you a message when you feel like you have no strength, when your confidence is gone. He promises to open a door for you, whatever the circumstances. And look at the doors that he has opened. Look at the lives he has changed. I invite you right now to place your faith in the God of the open door. Make him your savior. Make him your Lord. Don't let all the problems of life overwhelm you. Don't let the obstacles dominate your vision. Determine that you will find God's open door. Determine that you'll keep looking, keep persevering until you see that light breaking through the door, which only Christ can open. Would you like right now to say, Father, I want to see the light of heaven breaking through the open door. I want to see that light penetrating my darkness. I give my life to you looking for that light, that open door right now. Would you like to do that as we pray? Dear Father, we praise you because you bring us such great encouragement. You truly are a great physician who can meet each one of our needs. We need your strength. We need your perspective. We need your intervention. 
Please help us to find that open door you've prepared for us. Please help us to keep focused, to keep looking, until it appears before our eyes. In Jesus' name, amen. We all want answers to life's questions. We all need comfort and encouragement for our spiritual journeys. We're all looking for hope for the future. We're all together on the same planet with the same basic human needs. And God has direction for each of our lives. A good place to start your own spiritual journey is the It Is Written website at www.itiswritten.com. Here you'll find resources to enhance your walk with Christ. Go to the Studies page and explore the Bible in three free online Bible studies. View weekly It Is Written programs through streaming online video. Catch up on shows you may have missed in the Telecast Archive section. View the scriptures used in the current week's program. Print out the script from a show you liked for future reference. Find out about upcoming programs and see when and on what channel It Is Written is airing in your city. Go behind the scenes and get a feel for the It Is Written production process. Be the first to find out when an event with Mark Finley or other live It Is Written programs are coming to your hometown. Get the latest It Is Written ministry news and developments. Learn more about the ministry and read the history of the show that's been impacting our world for God since 1956. It Is Written is a donor-supported nonprofit ministry. On the website, you can sign up to become an It Is Written partner and make a secure online donation to help us fulfill the Great Commission. Visit the It Is Written store and find pages of spiritual resources like videos, DVDs, audio tapes, books, music, Bible studies, and digital media products. Be confident in buying online with our secure ordering system. Have a prayer request? There's a place where you can tell us your concerns. There's so much here for you on the It Is Written website. We encourage you to make it a frequent companion on your spiritual journey. Get connected to the source that can change your world, starting with you. God has a personal message for you from Philadelphia. In every circumstance of life, look for God's open door. Next week, we journey to the last of the seven churches, Laodicea, and discover the remedy for a lukewarm faith. Join us next week. Until then, remember, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God.